decoupled, and as I said, there are only a couple of non-conceptual elements left, and so it really does describe a lot in terms of a little. Uh, let me skip this. You have the time. Uh, so, with the quark masses in, we get an accurate theory of atomic nuclei. If we leave the quark masses, the up and down quark masses, to zero, we get an approximate theory, but a very good approximate theory of atomic nuclei. Uh, now, I've sh sh shown you that the, I told you that the equation is elegant, giving you some idea about what's involved. Uh, the main question should be, why should we believe you? Is it right, and how can we draw consequences from well, to see if it's right, we have to solve the equation, and that turns out to be quite challenging. This is something I call the big crunch. Uh, so let me tell you what's involved in the big crunch. You take something like 10 to the 30th protons and neutrons, hook them together so that they make a bank of parallel computers, run the computers for something like several months, so that's 10 to the 7 seconds, and uh, they run at teraflop rates, which means 10 to the 12 complicated multiplications per second. Don't try that at home. <laughs> And what are these 10 to the 30th protons and neutrons working so hard for so long doing? Well, they're doing what every single proton and every single neutron does every 10 to the minus 24th second. That is, figuring out how to balance the forces between quarks and gluons so as to get the minimum possible energy and make a stable state. So probably our methods of calculation could be improved. They're certainly not nature's way, but they do give us the answer. And here's what it looks like. So first, here's the problem. The observed particles that are supposed to be made out of quarks, and I call this QCD heavy because now I've included not only the up and down quarks, which are important for ordinary matter, but also other quarks, so that we have more things to compare. The observed particles that are supposed to be described by quarks and gluons have different masses and different other properties, spins and other properties that I won't go into detail on. And all of these things are supposed to emerge from those simple equations, from those simple with a capital S equations that have only three numbers in them. So, we need to measure those three numbers, and the most accurate measurement is by uh, fitting to three of these masses. So, these measurements are used to fix the theory, and now there's nowhere to hide. Now, everything, is concept everything further is purely conceptual, can't be changed. If, any, if the calculations are wrong, the theory is wrong. On the other hand, if the calculations look to be right, the theory can't be changed, and it's essential that if it's close to being right, it has to be exactly right. So you can't change it. So we fix the parameters, three parameters, and now comes the moment of truth. We have to see whether the calculations from this gigantic number crunch agree with the experiment, and with a sigh of relief, we see that they do. This, to me, is one of the greatest scientific achievements ever. Not just because it uses a beautiful theory to explain a lot of data through very difficult, uh, challenging calculations that press the limits of technology, but because one of these particles, N, N here stands for nucleon, these are the protons and neutrons, and so this, is give, this calculation is giving us a first principles, fundamental explanation and calculation of how the mass of protons and neutrons 
That is more than 99% of our mass and the mass of ordinary matter arises. We can look inside the computer now, we have faith that it's doing the right thing, to see what our eyes are not capable of seeing. Our eyes were not evolved, or perhaps designed, to see down to distances of order 10 to the minus 14 centimeters, or times as short as 10 to the minus 24 seconds. Those are the relevant times and distances for the things that are going inside, on inside protons. But using our minds and aided by the computers, we can calculate and have calculated uh, in the course of calculating the consequences of QCD, what's going on. So here it is. This is the deep structure of reality. Uh, this is what's going on. This is what your eyes would see if they were uh, attuned to fundamental physics as opposed to uh, avoiding predators and finding desirable mates and the things we were evolved for. Uh, you'd see this kind of modeling, which are the fluctuations in gluon field energy. This is calculated. This is not an artist, artist's impression or a lava lamp design. This is the actual calculation that's going on. And this is telling you what's happening all the time in empty space and, uh, inside the computer, and also inside the computer as it computes the mass of protons. This is spontaneous quantum activity, also called virtual particles. What is the picture of matter that emerges from this? Well, as I said, you uh, put down quarks, uh, let them settle, let them come into equilibrium with this fluctuating medium. In this picture, I've taken out the fluctuation, so you only see the net disturbance. If you put down three quarks, let it settle down, and uh, look at what you get, the energy distribution of what you get. This is our deepest understanding of what a proton is, it's kind of this disturbance in empty space that you get when you clump down a few quarks, let them settle down. This is how you calculate the mass and get all the properties. It looks ragged. That's because even with all the computer power I told you about thrown at it, the statistics of this calculation is still limited. So that instead of perfect, uh, smooth distributions, which we should have in reality, we still have a lot of noise. So this evolves for a while, settles down. This is, for experts, this is the energy distribution inside a proton, calculated from first principles. And if you add up all this energy and divide by c squared, that's the mass of the proton, coming basically from pure energy. Uh, here's that same thought in an equation. Before, we talked about E equals H nu, the Planck-Einstein-Schrodinger relationship between the energy of a quantum mechanical object and the frequency at which its wave function vibrates. We combine that with what I call Einstein's second law. Einstein's first law is E equals mc squared, but it has a nice corollary, m equals E divided by c squared. Combining those two, we find a unique relationship between the frequency of things we get when we put it, when we disturb empty space, disturb the vacuum, let it settle down. Pump it, like, let it settle down, see what it does, what tones it gets. And the frequencies of the tones that it gets are what we call and perceive as the masses of particles.